talking today to Brian Weed of Tesla, book Son of a Milkman, My Crazy Life with Tesla, came out back uh, late last year. I read the whole book, made, made a point to, to read it, and I did it in about a week, um, a couple of weeks ago, too, so I fully prepped for, for the chat today. First thing, actually, that, that jumped out as I'm reading the book, you mentioned a sister station of mine. Um, I'm in Eau Claire, Wisconsin with, with a Midwest family is, is, the, is the name of the ownership of this group. But WJJO in Madison is one of our sister stations. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And um, they, they, uh, they're the folks who are there kind of work with one of our sister stations. And in fact, I believe you're going to be talking to one of their DJs tomorrow. In fact, I was just on my way over and they said, hey, yeah, I'm going to be talking to Brian tomorrow. So there's, that, I was very glad to see WJJO just internally come up um, in, in the reference in the book. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, that that was that was from the Soul Motor days. Trying to get trying to get that going, correct? If I'm, it was a page one twenty two. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They 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 were big supporters of the Soul Motor record. You, um, I, I, first thing I really want to get into though, is the bass from Paul McCartney and the Hoffner. That was the first memory I I had of you watching MTV, ninety one, mm -hmm. when the the when Signs was was playing. And I remember seeing you playing the Hofner bass and going, that's that's the Paul McCartney bass. Back then I was just young enough, I just knew it. Hey, that's the violin bass. I do, I gotta say, I do have like the beginner, not the beginners, but it's like the low end model Hofner, one of those violin basses. Someone put that up for sale here in Eau Claire about five years ago and I had to buy it. So I do actually own one of those. So I know what you're thinking of with the whole Paul McCartney thing of just, you gotta own that type of bass. Um, how, when did you buy your first Hofner? Mm, 88 yeah 1988 that that Hoffner I bought it in New York at a place on 48th Street called We Buy Guitars and they had all this vintage uh basses and stuff in there how many, and that was that was in there how many how many do you own how many different types of Hoffners or violin basses do you have well today I have about eight nice nice yeah uh, but that that that's the first one. That's the one I did five minute acoustic jam with, and what you give and and stuff like that. What? How would you compare playing that kind of instrument to other bass guitars? I've noticed it's it's much lighter because you know it's hollow bodied and everything. It did, and for me being kind of a slight build, I, I prefer having that than a big fender that's kind of hanging off of me. What, how would you compare playing that kind of guitar to other basses? Well, that, that bass, you got to play with a completely different touch. You know, you can't be real heavy handed with it. Uh, you got to play it lighter. Um, you know, because the other bass I play all the time is a Thunderbird. So either I play a Thunderbird, a Gibson Thunderbird or a Hofner bass, depending on what kind of song it is, you know. Um, but that bass you know you can't really dig into you got to play it with a more light touch yeah i've noticed the same same kind of thing how has mccartney's bass influence his particular approach to playing that instrument affected how you play the instrument of the bass guitar well he's he's my you know my my number one influence so when i was learning how to play the bass and and stuff i was learning a lot of his bass lines so i mean it's affected me you know it's affected the whole way i play you went kind of the early route with beatles albums and you you'd mentioned how you were getting like especially with like revolver and such and then then you would start to hear the later music you're listening to the blue album and going what is it like oh wow this is all different from from the early songs what is the appeal to you of that earlier Beatles music, especially let's say the Red Album stuff, the 62 to 66. What really what really spoke to you in, in that music? Well, I I think from you know like help on it it really spoke to me. The the early stuff, you know, I want to hold your hand from me to you, she loves you and all that stuff. I never that never really, you know, got to me. The first thing I ever heard was Eleanor Rigby so that was you know that's 66 mm -hmm. so that, that that you know that record could have been in in the blue one because that was when it really 
really changed. You know, there's quite a contrast between rubber sole and revolver. Yeah. You almost could say there's like, three, you almost could have divided up three ways. There's pretty much everything up to, up to Beatles for sale. And then you could have the mid era, which changes in and of itself. Like you said, rubber soul and revolver and Sergeant Pepper, or they're all, there's such a, a, an evolution there. And then kind of the latter mm -hmm. era, the latter era stuff. And back to, back to the influence of McCartney and his, his playing on you. You could tell when he switches instruments and goes over to that Rickenbacker, the bass really becomes more pronounced when he, when he leaves the Hofner. You can really tell, especially on, on like a revolver and a Sergeant Pepper. And that stands out in the melodicism of his playing. Uh, that had to have really stood out to you as you're hearing that really booming out. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you listen to those bass lines, you know, from, from uh, you know, Pepper on. And he really got, you know, going at it. You mentioned a lot of studios as well. Bearsville comes out a lot in, in the book and taking time and recording the albums up there. If you could record at only one studio, whether it's a studio you've recorded at or one that just in, in the industry that's well known in the industry, what would it be? My studio in Sacramento. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> you talk about that. You you wrote up a what what I mean. You wrote about it in the book, but 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 re reiterate here in, in our in our chat. What really stands out about J Street and the the current version of J Street? Well, I you know I I created it, and you know it's got you know state of the art gear. But it's it's got a vibe in it that you know makes me want to be very creative. So it's it's you know it's like your dream house. You know when you build your dream house, you put everything in it you want. So this studio's got everything I want. It's got an atmosphere that makes me want to you know be creative. Is there um, is there any studio that comes the closest to? j street if for whatever reason you couldn't go in there anymore is there any place that you think it gets in the ballpark of that that has the most features that you'd like mm, well i mean you know bearsville's not there anymore that's where we did our first three albums you know i had kind of a, a thing for bearsville uh and then at all the other studios we ever been in, no, there was nothing that really yeah. makes me want to run back to any one of them. I presume you'd probably want to have, if any place would want to have a Nev console as well, which. There was, yeah, absolutely. You have to have a Neve console. Or Neve, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the mispronunciation on that. Which, yeah. which, which the guy died just not that long ago, just passed away. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, he was pretty old but he's a genius for i mean and, and neves and ssls are, are the two that we hear about the most and just growing up and reading about rock music and pop music i hear those those are the two boards that always hear about the most you obviously as we just said you're a neve person hands down i'm a neve guy yeah you're right what's to, to the lay listener who's going well it's it's a, it's a control board what's the difference okay well you know the difference What's the difference? Why is that that much better? It's not that much better. It's just the preference thing. It's like, do you like the Beatles or the Stones? Mm. Or do you like them both, you know? I mean, I happen to like them both, but if I'm going to pick a record, if you said, well, you, you could only pick one, I would pick the Beatles. You talked a lot about filming the early videos in particular, and the hairspray that had to go in, into that. You made the reference to... Um, to Welcome to the Jungle um, it, as a, another example of that, which always stood out to me as the oddball Guns N' Roses video. I was like, why is Axl Rose with hairspray in that one? But that was back when, yeah, let's make you all get your hair feathered up and all that sort of stuff for those first two videos. What overall of all the Tesla videos you've done, what is your favorite or are your favorites that you ever filmed? Mm, I like Evans Trail a lot. Um... Edison's Medicine, I think, was probably my favorite out of all of them. Why was that? 
it just was a really cool video and we looked really cool on it and you know it, i think it really captured what we were all about what's the best approach that when, when you're shooting a video what's the best approach that a, like a director could take with you guys and i mean that in the sense of like how hands-on hands-off kind of how they how they manage the whole thing what what do you guys look for that okay this this is a good way to do a video what what works best um just let us be natural you know do or do what we normally do when we try to you know act or or you know be something we're not it doesn't come across genuine managing came up a lot in the book um between your managing and managers you dealt with so what would you say is the most underrated aspect people would not necessarily know to being a successful manager in the music industry mm, how much time do you spend on the phone <laughs> <laughs> really yeah how much in a given day would you would would you find when you've been managing how how long do you spend on the phone how much do you time how much time do you spend communicating with others as a manager you know i even spend you know four or five hours a day wow when you're in the middle of a project mm -hmm. lots of pieces yeah love song was another thing you brought up about asking to release that as a Getting, getting that released as the third single back in late 89 and asking the asking management eventually going to the record company getting that thing released so if love song doesn't get released where do you think the band ends up well i don't think we'd be talking on the phone <laughs> you know yeah love song was the first hit and then you know, signs followed. I, I, you wouldn't, you know, Chessa wouldn't have those two top ten singles. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it would have been the same story. Yeah, I mean, do you think the band would have? And, and I know there was a fourth single that was released after that, but that, if history is going the way, the way that it goes, and Love Song isn't released, and they, and they end that. You think the band breaks up right after that? Is that probably what happens? Then you go on to other stuff if, if that song doesn't get released and goes top five? I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say, you know. I, I mean, you know, it, it was a big integral part. So uh, if, if that didn't happen, then, you know, we probably would have went and made another record and who knows what would happen. Yeah. What is the, what do you think is the most underrated Tesla song? Underrated Tesla Underrated, song? one that, that you don't hear too many people talk about it, whether it's fans or people in the industry, but one you go, you know what, that's a really special song. I almost wish it would get more attention from, from people, from any of the Tesla projects over the decades. Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> uh, underrated song. Or even, um, or even a favorite of yours that, does, that for whatever reason doesn't get talked about much, but you're like, I really love doing blank. I would say it's probably something in the later part of our career. You know, in, the, in that first part of our career, we were all over the radio. So, all, all, you know, we got a lot of, a lot of uh, attention in terms of stuff i think there's some really good songs on the later albums you know yeah. that you know because we haven't been on the radio as much that probably you know i don't know let's say you know i want to live or falling apart you know i think are really good songs life's a river mm -hmm. is is probably a, a really underrated song if you had the opportunity to remix everything from the early era, and you talked a little bit about how the the production of the of the early albums, how that how that sounded with reverberation, and, and especially going back to mechanical resonance. Um, if you could kind of do what like like Pearl Jam did with their first album and re 
mix it, remaster it and make it sound. Is there is there a producer you'd want to bring in? Is there a certain approach you'd take? Would you even do that? Or is it, look, the album was the album. That's what people heard. That's the history of it. Or would you want to re-record the songs? What, what would you say about the ones where you go sonically, maybe it could, the actual recorded output could have been different. What, what approach would you prefer? To well, take? I don't have any problem with the Celtics. I have a problem with the way it was mixed. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So, um, you know, I wouldn't have anyone come in. I, I, we would do it ourselves and, and, and remix it. Um, you know, the first album in particular has, you know, all this reverb on it and stuff. And I think if you had the first album sound more like Psychotic Supper, it'd been amazing. What do you think is the essence of Tesla? You talked about at one point in the book dealing with, with Troy, about how, like, for example, it's different working with him on, with Soul Motor on, on I think it was on Revolution Wheel versus Into the Now. And the different maybe the different vibe and working within the confines of the band so what maybe first i'll ask it this way what's the vibe between everyone when you're creating and playing music with each other and then bringing that into the essence of what is the band tesla and that that group of you guys that have been in the band for so long yeah uh, you know i mean the creative process is the interesting process with tesla i mean there's a lot of you know, that goes into it. I think the point I was, you know, making a, about Troy was just that, you know, at that time, you know, we were struggling to find, you know, common ground communicating with each other, uh, which, you know, today is completely fine. I just saw him last week. He came and stayed two days with me in Sacramento. So, you know, in the book, I just you know, kind of putting out there that as a band, we're like any band, you know, every band has, you know, a certain amount of problems and a certain amount of harmony. And, you know, the point I was making is that we've survived. We overcame, you know, all the obstacles that were thrown at us that like any band, we, you know, we, we fight, you know, we took drugs, we drank, we did everything that any other band did. This is the point I was trying to make. Alfie. I hear I hear him in the background that <laughs> Alfie, 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 come here, buddy. Come here. Stop it. No, 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 no. Stop Alfie. Jack Russell. <laughs> Not it's, three Jack Russells. I I love it. I have a I have a Morky at home. It's not quite a Jack Russell, obviously, but but I I know what I'm hearing in the in the background. I'll hear the same thing when I'm at at home. Come here. What I'm trying to do an interview, buddy. That's okay. We can have a dog on. That's totally fine. I love it. Hey, you guys, stop it. How, is is it just him? How many dogs do you no. have by you right now? And Spanky and Alfalfa, they're they're playing. <laughs> That's great. I love this. This is this is wonderful. Oh my gosh, this, this is great. Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm saying hi to the dog. Uh, Spanky, now Spanky starting in. Oh boy. <laughs> One dog <laughs> barking next to another. Hey, 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 come on now. I'm on the phone. <laughs> no, you can't sing. No. Okay, okay, I know. Daddy loves this. <laughs> oh, that's that's so fun. I seriously, this this is great. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. I think that I think that happened with one of my other interviews. There there was a like a dog or a cat in the background. Got on. I think it was a dog, and it was absolutely adorable. So I I love it. I I I I love that you wrote so much about your dogs in in the book too. Well, they're my children. Right. You yeah. know, they're, 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 you know, they're me and my wife's children. Uh-huh. So. Do you always see yourself? You know, people, you... people come over and they're like, you know, you treat your dogs better than people. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I like okay. my dogs better than most people. Well, it's unconditional love with them. That's, that's what I've known all my life. And I'm sure you've known the same thing all your life as well. Uh you see yourself always having Jack Russells? 
Yeah, my wife doesn't, but we've had seven of them. I, I always like Jack Russells. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think they're just amazing dogs, and they're all unique. Every one we had was unique. It had its own thing, you know? Uh-huh. And, you know, I mean, the only other dog I had, I had I had a uh, German Shepherd, and I had a German Shepherd Collie Bix. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the only you know, the dogs I had. Uh, and then when I was a kid, we had a poodle, a, a kind of a bigger poodle. Mm-hmm. You know, not a huge one, but, you know, a little bit bigger than a Jack Russell. Got it. Um but yeah, I've got a thing for Jack Russells. That's good. That's good. And like I said, I, I got a Morky at home, so it's 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 a mix, obviously. Um, yeah. There are def- there are definite Jack Russell characteristics that'll that'll come out of uh, come out of our dog at, at home, and my my wife and I absolutely adore him. So um, yeah. yeah, I I know what you're talking about with the Jack Russells. It's it's <laughs> it's it's great. Um, you mentioned Italy a lot. Have you gotten? much musical influence from all the time you spent in Italy. Well, I've got a little studio in my house in Italy. So, you know, I do do some work when I'm there. Um, Not really writing though. I do a lot of mixing there. And, uh, but I do take stuff away from Italy when I go. And then I go back, when I go back to, you know, you know, I remember this one particular day I was at a, um, at a parade called the Modulata in our village, Lucignano. And there was all these drums going on and it just sounded massive. So I recorded it with my phone, this drum, you know, marching drum thing. And, uh, you know, I've used that in a song just, you know, cause it was so cool. Mm. Cool. Is there a, a you, and again, I, I, I can kind of get a feel for it. I've never been to Italy myself, but I, I as a reader, I could kind of get a feel for the the vibe, the environment around there when you're writing about that. How how can you describe that 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 feeling of, of being there versus being and, and then being in a position to go in and mix music there versus doing so at any location here in the United States? Um, you know, it's just nice if you, you know, you wake up in Tuscany and you go in your, your mix room and you open the windows and you see the Tuscan countryside. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I don't know that the mixes are any better than they <laughs> yeah. are when I'm in America or anything, right. but you know, it's, it's really nice atmosphere to surround yourself in when you're, you know. I mean, Italy's just amazingly beautiful. So anything you do there, eating a sandwich is, you know, cooler than eating a sandwich in yeah. the middle of West Texas or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've never done either one. I've never been to West Texas nor Italy. So I'll have to. I'll well, have I've to... been to both. I have houses in both. And, and uh, you know, I'd rather be in Italy all year long. <laughs> Looking forward, now the book is out. What's what are you going to be doing next? What are your next projects when in any capacity, solo, Tesla, anything? What what are you doing? Well, the next? next thing I'm going to do is put out a bunch of soul motor music. I've got a bunch of songs recorded and finished with soul motor, and that's going to come out, you know, on the heels of the book, and then you know, then hopefully Tesla will go back and start playing, and then after that you know, talk about doing a new record. Cool. So, you know, that's the next things in line for me. Uh, you know, there's talk about me doing another book. So, you know, I'll probably start working on that, you know, this year. Hmm. And uh, I'm always, you know, doing something. I always Are, staying busy. Nice. Are you at liberty to say what the subject of that other book would be? I don't know yet. Honestly, um, I don't know, you know, what it would be. Cool. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. Well, you know, well, we'll be looking forward to it anyway because this was a good book to read and it was really descriptive of, of your life. And I learned a lot 
from it. So it was a good read and anyone listening, I would encourage to read it as well. Son of a Milkman, My Crazy Life with Tesla from Brian Weed. Thanks for taking some time and, uh, and and even having the dogs on on board with this one. Yeah, Good. well, you know, off, off the decided he wanted to start singing. So. <laughs> well, you got got another vocalist if you need a backing vocalist, so that works out. So yeah. So thanks, uh, you know. I mean, one thing I've thought about is maybe doing a a book on Jack Russell's. You know, my experiences with all by my Jack Russell's. That may be you know something I've contemplating going back and forth on it's a lot of jack russell fans out there you know mm -hmm. that would that would be fun that's that i like that idea already so cool well thanks brian for taking the time to to chat today good book good chat and all